Luke chapter 16 from verses 19 to 26, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs will come and lick his open sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, that's the rich man, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good thing, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which will pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from Dance. This story is not a story about poverty and wealth. The rich man did not go to hell because he was rich, and Lazarus did not go to Abraham's bosom because he was poor. Rather, this story is a story between good and evil. The rich man went to hell because he was evil and because he was wicked. But let's move on. So we have two sections in this place of the dead. One section is where Lazarus went, and the other section is where the rich man went. What is the characteristic of where Lazarus went? The Bible called it Abraham's bosom. And where the rich man went, the Bible called it hell. So we have Abraham's bosom, where the good, the saint go, and we have hell, where the rich man or the wicked or the evil people go. As we are reading that story, it gave us two more characteristics about Abraham's bosom. He said there was water there and it was a place of comfort. Now, when we go to the second compartment, hell was a place of torment and it was a place of flame. So last episode, we look at the meaning of Abraham's bosom. And as we were rounding up, we noted his connection with this water. Let us look at another word that is associated with Abraham's bosom. What is that word again? Comfort. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good thing, and likewise Lazarus evil thing, but now he, that is Lazarus, is comforted. And obviously the rich man is being tormented. So Lazarus is comforted because Abraham's bosom is a place of comfort. Now the word that is translated comforted, in Greek to English is the word parakaleo. Parakaleo. Does that strike a word? Does that strike a chord? Does that make you remember something or someone? Yes, it does. And we'll come to that. The Greek word is parakaleo, comforted. It is to call to one side, to someone, to console, to encourage, to strengthen. That is that what that word means. And I think that the association of Abraham's bosom with water and comfort is quite revealing. Okay, that association is very, very, very important because of what? Because these two words are strongly associated, number one, with the Holy Spirit primarily. Water and comfort, they, both words are strongly, strongly associated with the Holy Spirit, but they are also secondarily associated with the Eden garden <laughs> and we've seen this in the past so water and comfort are associated with the holy spirit and they are associated with eden garden water speaks of life and comfort water speaks of life and comfort and where you find water you expect to find life you know the people that explore space one of the things they look for to be able to determine whether life exists in all this other planet. They look for water because anywhere you find water, then there will be life. Or alternatively, or in contrast, if there's no water somewhere, there cannot be life there. 
So it is very, very important for us to understand this association. And when we were in ex- episode 236, we saw that the tree of life throughout the scripture is also closely associated with water. When you look throughout the scripture, the tree of life from the beginning to the end, the middle, you remember we did all that beginning and middle. The tree of life is often associated, closely associated with water. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. <laughs> In John chapter 14, verse 16 and verse 26, John chapter 15, verse 26, and John chapter 16, verse 7. The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. And what is the Greek word that is used for the Holy Spirit? Obviously, you know that Paracletus. Lazarus is being comforted, Paracaleo. The Holy Spirit is the Comforter. Paracletus. What does Paracletus mean? Someone called to one side to help. Counsel for the defense, legal assistant, and advocate. Uh, this is very, very important. Okay. Lazarus is being comforted, but somebody must be comforting him. The Holy Spirit is the Paracletus, is the one, is the someone that is called to one side to help. It's like a counsel for the defense. It's like a legal assistance or an advocate. So, so why have I gone round and round talking about this? Abraham's bosom. This is the point. When you put all this together, you will see that Abraham's bosom was a garden. Abraham's bosom was a paradise. Abraham's bosom was a place of rest. Abraham's bosom was a place of comfort. In other words, Abraham's bosom was a type and a shadow. Of heaven. Abraham's bosom was a type and a shadow of heaven. And apparently, I read that the Jews used to call the good state of the dead, the good state of the dead, they call it the bosom of Abraham, and they actually also call it the garden of Eden. So, actually, the Jews of those days refer to the bosom of Abraham also as the garden of Eden, or they refer to the place where the good dead went, they refer it to the bosom, they refer it as the bosom of Abraham or as the garden of Eden. So this understanding that we are beginning to touch of Abraham's bosom immediately reminds us of an incident that happened on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, you remember that incident. That was the one involving the thief on the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are reading Luke chapter 23. Let's read verse 24 first. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. They wanted the Lord Jesus Christ crucified. And you know all the story that led to that. So Pilate gave sentence that the Lord Jesus should be crucified. Somebody that he clearly said was innocent. But be as it may, let's move on. Let's jump down now to verse 32. And there were also two other male factors led with the Lord Jesus Christ to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and also the thieves, the male factors, one on the right and the other one on the left. Now we are going to drop down because it is this conversation between the Lord Jesus Christ and the thief on the right that we are interested in. But verse 39. And one of the male factors which were hanged rail on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Verse 41. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto the Lord Jesus, or he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Verse 43, this is where we are going. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. There are two words we need to look at closely in that sentence. The first word, obviously, is the word today. Today. Now, the Greek word that is translated today is very emphatic. What the Lord Jesus is saying is, this very day, today, this very day is, is emphatic. This very day, not tomorrow, not next day, 
this very day you will be with me in paradise today today as in contrast to later now as in contrast to later today as in contrast to tomorrow or another time so the lord jesus told the thief on his right today you will be with me in paradise okay the second word obviously we need to define is that word paradise and that word paradise is from the greek word paradeisos paradeisos and that word is derived from the Persian word Padis, which means king's garden, <laughs> pleasure ground, a park, in other words, an Eden, a garden, a place of comfort, a place of delight. And that is what that word paradise means. So the Lord Jesus was telling this thief on the right that immediately both of us give up the ghost we will both be somewhere together. Immediately, both of us give us the ghost. We will both be somewhere together that very day. And the Lord Jesus called that destination paradise. He called that destination a king's garden, a pleasure ground, a park, and Eden. So the question then is, where was this particular paradise of which the Lord Jesus spoke of which he was speaking to this thief on his right. Notice that this immediate journey to this particular paradise is not the same as when about just over 40 days later, the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Okay, it's not the same. This this journey, this immediate journey is, is a journey on that day, not 40 days. The Lord Jesus said today, this day, not next day, not 40 days. It is something that happened that day. And it's not something that happened 40 days later. So this immediate journey to this particular paradise is not the same as the journey that the Lord Jesus took when he ascended into heaven. Why else are we sure of this? It is because when the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead on the third day, he had an encounter with Mary. John chapter 20, verses 16 and 17. Jesus said unto her, Mary, Mary turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Now that's important. This is why I've come here. The Lord Jesus told Mary, No, no, stop clinging to me. I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended unto my father and your father, and to my God, and your God. Now, this is very, very important that we understand this, that the Lord Jesus Christ told Mary, I have not yet gone up to the Father. So, that means that as of that moment in the timeline of the crucifixion, the Lord Jesus Christ has not yet gone up to the Father. He has not yet gone up to God, the Father. So, the paradise of which the Lord Jesus spoke to the thief on his right was not the paradise of God. If you read Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, he also talked about the paradise of God. Now, the paradise of God is, to, is the true paradise, is the ultimate paradise. That is the paradise that all other paradises foreshadow. <laughs> okay, that is the true paradise. But that was not the paradise the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of when he was talking to this thief on his right. So, the Lord Jesus went to another paradise. Where was that? He went to Abraham's bosom. He went to the unseen realm of the dead where the righteous saint go. Now, what he did there and why he did what he did will be a topic for future New Testament episodes. Now, we are not going to concern ourselves with what he did there and why he did what he did. When we get to the New Testament, we'll look at that a little bit more. But there is just one more information that is relevant to our study today. I'm going to read Mark 2, chapter 27, because there's an incident there that will also help us in our study today. So let us read Matthew, chapter 27, and we are going to read from verses 50 to 53. This was an incident that happened when the Lord Jesus resurrected. Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 to 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, 
and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now, verse 52, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the grave after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now, these verses tell us, when the Lord Jesus Christ cried, four things happened. Number one, the veil of the temple was rent into two from top to bottom. Now, we are not going we are not going into detail as to the meaning of this. We are much more interested <laughs> in other things, really. So four things happened. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Number two, there was an earthquake. Number three, that earthquake causes the rocks to, to rent, the rocks to break. And number four, that earthquake caused graves to open. Okay, graves were cracked. I mean, the earthquake that busted rock will obviously also bust grave open. So far, so good. But something else happened, as we read. But what else happened, happened after the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected. That is what we read there, that they came out of the grave after his resurrection. So what then happened is that after his resurrection, the Bible tells us where we read that many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave. This event that I have just read is wide, widely debated among scholars. Many scholars view them as a mythical addition to the story of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ rather than an historical event. Some scholar interpret it just as an allegory of the final resurrection of God's people. Now, this reluctance on the part of the scholars to accept this as an historical event is totally expected because this event is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, it's only found in the Gospel of Matthew. You, 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 we don't find it in all the synoptic gospel, Mark and Luke, definitely not in John. Also, there are some debate around the construct of the original text, which I'm not going to concern myself. We are not going to concern ourselves with. I think it is clear that the raising of the saint fit into the overall trajectory of the story of the cross. Okay, And I like the way Ellicott's commentary of English readers put it. There's this commentary called Ellicott's Commentary for English reader. I like the way he put it commenting on this event and I'm just going to read it out to you. I think it is well put. We can hardly imagine the evangelist, that is Matthew, we can hardly imagine the evangelist as writing without having received his information from witnesses whom he thought trustworthy. And then the question rises whether the narrative is of such a character as to be in itself incredible. On that point, men, according to the point of view from which they look on the gospel record, may naturally differ. Now, it's the second part of this commentary that is really great. But those who believe that when our Lord Jesus or when our Lord passed into Hades, that is the unseen world, it was to complete there what had, what had begun on earth, to proclaim there his victory over death and sin will hardly think it impossible that there should have been outward token and witnesses of such a work. Let me read it, just that second part again. But those who believe that when our Lord passed into Hades, the unseen world, it was to complete there what had been begun on earth, to proclaim there his victory over death and sin, will hardly think it impossible that there should have been outward tokens and witnesses of such a work remember 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 how we got here we are looking at abraham's bosom this is what brought us here and the reason that we got to abraham's bosom is that we are looking at the question of enoch where did enoch and elijah go when god took them so this is my point this is my point that enoch and elijah went to the same place all the saints of old testament went when they died we've seen that they went to abraham's bosom they went to a garden they went to a paradise. They went to a place of rest, a place of comfort, the shadow of the paradise of God. I believe the testimony of the scripture is that Old Testament saints could not ascend into heaven 
because their sins were covered by the Le- Levitical system of atonement using blood of animals. And therefore, Abraham's bosom was a holding place. So these Old Testament saints, they were held in Abraham's bosom until their sins were paid in full, obviously, by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by his blood that was shed on the cross. From what we've read, the Lord Jesus Christ went to Abraham's bosom with a thief, the one that was on his right hand, on the very day that he was crucified. And when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven after his resurrection, he took all the saints who were in Abraham's bosom with him. If you read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8, I'm not going to read that today. And since then, all the New Testament saints, when they die, they go immediately to be with Jesus in heaven. We read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. And I believe that that is the timeline of what happened. So where are Enoch and Elijah now? They are now in heaven with all the Old Testament dead saints and also the New Testament saints. They are there with all the other saints awaiting their resurrection body. Again, there are other points we could discuss with respect to what we've read, particularly in that book of Matthew with respect to the grave opening. But we are going to leave those points to be discussed in greater detail at appropriate junction. What we have done today is to answer our question, okay? And there are quite a number of things that this have actually enlightened us with respect to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on, on the cross. And actually, some of the things we need to know about the Old Testament saint, when they died, where they were, and where they are now. So we are going to stop here for today by the grace of God. I mean, this has been exciting for me, this particular study. And if you are listening to me tonight, I want you to know that God wants you to spend eternity with him, but it is your choice. But the only thing is that you cannot get crash, you cannot get crash heaven. You have to have a proper entrance visa. <laughs> you have to be born again. Okay. He has provided a way. Jesus came. He died for us. Okay. All we need to do is to accept him as our Lord and Savior. Ask him to save us. He will save us. And then we... We accept him as our Lord. We obey him. We follow him. He walks with us the rest of our life on this earth. And when this is over and it's going to be over, we can then spend eternity with him, not in Abraham's bosom, because Abraham's bosom is now empty. But we'll spend eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth. Do it right now.